See, you, you think like an investor, your mindset shifts, and you stop thinking about what do I have to pay and is what is they're going to pay. Not you, because you're an investor. Every wealthy person understands the power of leverage, the power of using other people's money, other people's time, other people's systems, other people's teams. So when you use to use the, learn to use the insurance company's money instead of your own money, it's going to change your life because now we can learn how to make money two to three times off the same dollar. I work to learn and earn. It wasn't just earning. I wanted to learn. Then I wanted to use the knowledge that I have to solve a problem because money chases pro problem solvers. Anybody who has a problem right now will release their money to get that problem solved. I want them to be smart. Not smart as an in intelligent, right? I need them to be specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. Stop telling me you want, you want to save money. Stop telling me I want to invest. Stop, no, I need to know specifically, put a number to it. Be specific, be able to measure it. Because if you have a goal and you can't measure it, how do you know you achieved it, right? And achievable does not mean whether it's possible or not. Achievable means do you believe that you can have it? Because if you don't believe you can have it, it's not going to happen. Even if you get it temporarily, if you don't believe it, it's going it's to pass through you. But guess what? It's going to pass through you and go to somebody who believes it. So sometimes you're the conduit. Sometimes your lack of belief was supporting somebody else's belief. Oh, 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 don't miss that. Don't miss that. Right? Realistic is can you absorb everything that's happening right now? Sometimes, imagine getting all your pleasure at one time. Think about it. If a plane from the ground to its highest altitude, if it went too fast, everybody on the plane would die. Uh, don't miss that. If a plane went to its highest altitude too fast, everybody is going to die. Why? Because the pressure that it takes to get to the highest altitude, you're not ready for that pressure. So when I say your, your goals need to be realistic, how much pressure can you handle? How much pressure are you ready for? And then lastly, timely. I want all your goals to be timely. And what time are you going to achieve these goals? Number two, I want you to ignite your savings. It wasn't raining when Noah built the ark, right? So that means I want you to make sure that you have some liquidity. We're not saving money because we know it's all about investing. You have to, if you want to build wealth, you have to invest. Invest first in who? yourself, and then once you invest in yourself, you get the information to invest out. And so what I need you to do, right, is to create not an emergency fund. Some financial advisors got it wrong. They say, yo, get an emergency fund. Well, I ain't calling emergencies in, into my life. I'm good. You can have the emergency fund, right? You can have that. But I, I, do, have an, I do have a financial freedom fund, right? And so put some assets aside. Make it automatic, make it inconvenient, forget about it, right? Find a, find a local bank, find a regional bank, put a percentage aside. Based on, on what your lifestyle costs today, you should have at least six to eight months of, of, of expenses in that account available to you liquid. Everything else invest. Everything else that's not in that, that, that's, that exceeds that six to eight months, you're, you're giving money away. All right, number three. I need you to visualize your budget. Visualize this thing you want, see it, feel it, believe it, make it your mental blueprint and begin. 
right? You have to have a budget. I don't care if you got multi-millions, if you don't have a budget, you'll be throwing money away, right? And so how do you budget? I need you to first gather all financial statements. Write down all of your income, create a list of monthly expenses, total your monthly income and monthly expenses, and write down what your ideal lifestyle costs. And then fill in the gap. They used to say needs are better than wants and get rid of, no, we're not doing that. Abundance is your birthright, right? And so, and so if, if there's something that exceeds my current budget, I'm not cutting nothing. I'm calling Storm and Marvin. I say, y'all, what we doing? <laughs> Wife wanna go, wanna go away. Let's go. What we doing? All right, let me, let me, let me, let me stop putting everything on her because I'm the spender. She just say, let me stop doing that. Right? Number four, examine your options. Oh, wait, let me go back real quick because I forgot a, a, a very important point. And is better than or. And is better than or. Everybody, and is better than or. And is better than or. I'm not making choices that require me to cut something out. If there's something I desire, I want it and. And is better than or. I'm not choosing between this and that. I'm not choosing between love or happiness. I want them both. I want them both. Both of them. B-O-A-F. Both. Right? So and is better than or. Number four, I want you to uh, examine your options. Right? The average millionaire has at least seven streams of income. Seven streams of income. Right? And that doesn't mean I want you to do seven things, though. I need you to do one thing very, very well. Create, no, right? We don't want ponds. We don't want rivers. We want streams. So I want you to do one thing very, very well, make a whole lot of money, and then find different ways that you could take, make money from that one thing. Right? And so I need you to start active, then build up passive. Because if you're like me, I grew up in the projects, apartment 1A, I didn't come for money. And so in the beginning, I had to work. So, but look, look what I did. I worked to learn and earn. It wasn't just earning. I wanted to learn. Then I wanted to use the knowledge that I have to solve a problem. Because money chases pro problem solvers. Anybody who has a problem right now, will release their money to get that problem solved. So use the knowledge you have to solve a problem. Now, when you get money, you use that money to make more money, but you buy income producing assets, and then you repeat. And so here's some common ways for passive income, right, interest, dividends, capital gains, royalties, rental income, business income. Be careful with business income, because sometimes that could become your job. Right? You're like, oh, I want to leave my nine to five. I don't want to work so hard. Then you, get, then you get a business and you work harder than you ever worked before in your life. Right? So be careful with that. Me, y'all know what I love. I love books. Right? And that's why I say, right, find one thing. Do it so well. I've been an author for over 13 years, wrote 12 books, sold hundreds of thousands of books. All self-published. So all the people that be like, oh, books are just a business card. Well, you just don't know how to make money. Because I, cause, cause I take the same book and I flip it 15 times. Why? First, I got my physical book. Then I go audio for my, for my Uber drivers and my people on the go all the time who like, yo, I don't got time, right? Then I take the same information that's in the, in the book and I, and I break it down into different chapters and I sell them as e-books. Oh, look, don't miss that. Where Reggie at? Reggie just held up. Look, my right, money right. Ten laws of financial freedom. Do you know? Don't tell nobody outside this room. 
Do you know I took all 10 of those chapters? I sell them at, as ebooks right now at $17. That book is $9.99. So that same, same information that, I, that, that, that I'm charging $9.99 for, I make $170. When somebody buys the ebook, they say, I like this. What's next? What's next? What's next? Oh, don't miss that, y'all. Y'all playing. <laughs> Number four, right? Look, self study online program. The same information I take in the book, I say, oh, let me do a course because y'all want, want more information. So let me create a course out of it. Then I say, oh, let me do a live coaching program because people are going to have some questions. They want to ask me questions. So I do a live coaching program. Then I say, oh, you know what? I can't be everywhere. People want to teach what I, what I know. So I, oh, you know what? Let me create a certificate program. How many, oh, that's six? How many is that? Oh, six, right? Oh, you know what? Let me, let, me, let me start a conference and teach my principles in front of a live audience. So I'm going to do a keynote speak, speaking. I'm going to get paid to talk about what's in my book. Then do what? Sell books in the back. Chill, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, hold on, then, then I write a book, right, then I write a book that's talking about credit, and the credit agencies are like, Ash, I love your audience, can I pay you to talk about my product and promote what? My book. Chill. Then I do live events, then I go around the country and do all these different live events on the same concept of the book. Then I say, okay, now that I got an audience, I'm going to run, run a conference. I'm going to charge for a conference, all from the book. Then I'm going to say, hold on. Let me do a subscription program. Let me, let, me, let me charge a little bit of money so people can get more access to me. But no, what about, what about the people who want more access? So I'm going to do high-end console. I'm going to do a, a high-ticket item where they can get more of me. Oh, that's 12. Oh, 13. Then I do a mastermind group because some people want it, want it the faster way. They're like, oh, I don't want to do the group. Let, let, oh, let's just mastermind with other, other high earners. So we do a mastermind group. They say, oh, man, Ash, let's go on a partnership together. Let's do something. This synergy. So we do some joint ventures based on the book. And the last, the affiliate program. People love your stuff so much they want to sell it for you. So you create an affiliate program. That's all 15 ways off of one book. Play with me, Chung. You play if you want. All right, number five. I need you to learn to keep learning. Learn to keep learning. Or like my brother Storm says, always seek knowledge. Right? Because you got to understand, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. I've been in this game 13 years at, at a high level. Don't play with me. Google, I, I've been here at a high level. But it, it, it's not because I'm complacent. When magazines was a thing, I was in magazines. When blogs was a thing, I was in blogs. When radio was a thing, I did radio. Oh, are we podcasting now? All right, I'm a podcaster. Call me what you want. Just don't call me broke. <laughs> call me what you want. Right, so I need you to read, right? I need you to research, right? Make sure you do your research. Make sure you're engaging others like this. You get in a room, right? You don't know what you don't know, so ask questions as much as possible. And then deal with the unknown. Number six, I want you to imagine your success. You're not going to have success if you can't believe that you can have it, if you don't see it. So I need you to imagine this thing, right? Write it down. Visualize it. Have that vision board and, and feel what it looks like. Yo, we family here? Can I share my vision board with y'all? Y'all good? Y'all sure? All right. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? You feel me? You feel me? Right? I got to see it. Look, look, my, my, my wife looked the same for 20 years. I gained some weight, you know what I'm saying? I got comfortable. So I said, look, I want to, you know, I want to dance to genuine for her. Like, so why? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's the vision. Write it and make it plain, right? All right, number seven, find a mentor. Mentors changed my life, right? Mentors have changed my life. If, if anybody asks me the single one thing that has helped me tremendously, I'm going to say it's, it's mentorship, right? Denzel Watson says, show me a successful individual and I'll show you someone who had a real positive influence in his or her life. I don't care what you do for a living. If you do it well, I'm sure there was someone cheering you on and showing you the way, a mentor, right? I have four mentors in my life. 
currently, right? Alfred Edmond, Senior Vice President at Black Enterprise. First person to show me it's possible to make money talking about money, right? Second mentor, John Hope Bryant. I, ju I just got invited, right, to an event by my mentor who said, look, I'm gonna show y'all how to, how, how, to, how to do a $200 million deal, right? So my mentor calls me and says, Ash, you in Atlanta? I said, yeah. He said, yo, I'm having an event, come through. I'm gonna show my deal sheet and everything. $200 million deal, right? Mentorship is important because now my mind is on that, right? How, how do I create a, a company that has a billion dollar valuation? That's, that's all I think about now, right? Rashawn McDonald, who used to be Steve Harvey's manager, who helped Steve Harvey grow to a $100 million brand. He's my media mentor. And so when you see Ash on television soon, you'll know I'm getting the, the information, the wise information from people who came before me. Myron Golden, round of applause, Myron Golden. Yo, let, yo, let me tell you, they set me up. They set me up. I look and they say, yo, you, you, you talk before Myron. I say, so I said, I better, let me, let, me, let me get my best performance, right? Help me change my mindset on how fast I can make money. I wanted, them, I wanted to make seven figures in a year. I got into this, he said, in a, that's a day? What, a day? Not a month? I could do it in a, all right, no, a, a day? So we're gonna talk about that. But also you, you're my mentor, right? Anybody, any life that I've ever touched, anybody I'm ever around, mentor me in all ways. That's why I speak to everybody. Round of applause for y'all, thank you, right? Thank you for pouring into my life. Because without you, it's not me. Because think about this, I, I am a billionaire. Because there's no way I'm on stage talking to Grant Cardone, talking to him, right? Because everything is about energetic alignment. You cannot get what you're, what you're not energetically aligned with. And so I'm energetically aligned with billions of dollars, so now I'm attracting billionaires, right? Y'all are attracted, energetically alignment with multi-millionaires, billionaires, because you're in this room, right? And so if you're in energetic alignment, that means we're, we're vibing on the same vibration, so why I think I can't learn from you? Number eight, execute the plan. All of this doesn't work if you don't execute. You gotta execute the plan, right? Ideas don't make you rich. I know, I know tons of people who had ideas and in a grave and, and them ideas die with them. It's the proper execution of ideas, right? You have to act. ACT, action changes things. And when are you gonna act? When are you gonna act? When are you gonna act? Let's go. Number nine, normalize positive thoughts. Things happen. They happen to everybody. They happen to billionaires, millionaires, poor people. It happens to everybody. So normalize positive thoughts. The best and the most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen, touched. They must be felt with the heart, right? Some people are going to look at doom and gloom and focus on that. But are you going to focus on the sun? Number 10, I need you to observe and change when necessary. I can't change the direction of the wind, but I can adjust my sails to always reach my destination. And then lastly, I'm, I want you to win on purpose. Right? Scissor once said, I don't have any control over what actually happens ex except for that I have full control over myself, my intention, and why I'm there. That's all that matters. Right? Right now, how many people got Amazon Prime? Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. When I order something on Amazon Prime, I expect it to be there when I ordered it. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. Y'all ready? When somebody prays to God or they hire power for something, they expect it to be there. And a lot of y'all are the answers to somebody's prayer. And you, hold, you holding it up, though. You holding up the package, though. Look, you holding up the package because you don't like the way the box look. I ain't order no box. I ain't order no box. Look, you don't have the right 
to hold back your gift because you don't like the box. Responsibility comes with a price tag. Let's be wise about that. Let me not get into a whole different thing here. So I need you to think like a CEO. You guys still with me? Talk to me. Let's do it. Now, how am I going to do you this? I want you to treat out-of-state properties just like these properties are stocks. By doing what? I need you to know exactly how much of these properties will be making if it's a stable property and the history of that property income. Will we not be buying properties that are not making money? So, and I also need you to know this. Anytime you purchase a property out of state, which is the basis of this conversation, you need to be ready to sell your property that's not making money. I don't hold properties for no more than five years. Oh, wait a minute. You know why? Because if that property starts to lose, its mo lose money, I want to get rid of it. I treat it like a stock that's falling. If a stock is failing and falling and falling and falling, you just go, I'm going to leave my money there because one day it's going to come back up. No, that's not how a CEO thinks. That's a stop loss. So you have to be prepared. How do you become successful in out-of-state real estate? By knowing your numbers. And I need you guys to get ready because we're going to do some math. I'm going to do a quick deal analysis with you guys. Get your pens and papers ready. There's a thing called the 1% rule. The 1% rule strictly states that if the asking price on a property is $100,000, the rent needs to be 1% of that, which is $1,000. 1% rule. We're going to do a pop quiz. I just need you to yell, make some noise when I go through this. 1%, 210,000, rent 2,100. Is that 1%? Yes. yes, it is. Next one. If property's $80,000, the rent is $800, is that 1%? Yes. yes, I can speed through this. You guys get the hang of it. This one, 175,000, rent 1,700, is that 1%? No. no, it's not. But guess what? There's room to negotiate. $500. So we can negotiate on that one, but if the property is two hundred dollars and you think you're going to get it for $100,000, that's a bridge too far for that seller to cross. So don't waste your time trying to do those numbers. That's not going to work. So now let's talk about something else. We're going to talk about calculating a mortgage. Every $100,000 mortgage is $500. Just that simple. Every mortgage is $100,000. Now we're going to calculate profits right now. Math example, a property is $100,000. The rent needs to be 1%. What does that make it? $1,000. I just told you a $100,000 mortgage is $500. So if that's the case, if the, if the rent's $1,000 and the mortgage is $500, then what's your profit? Man, you could, that's it. $500. Just that easy. And why is that so important? Because when you start off using the 1% rule, you already start making 30% return on your investment. 30% return when the minimum is 10%. You're at 30% just by following that rule. And the key thing is you don't waste time. And the subject is really about time when you think it's about real estate. But I was going to save that for you. This is what this is about, time management. Right? Cash flow is king. Now, let's talk about mastering your cash on cash return. Cash on cash return, when you're doing real estate and you're doing investments and you want to know your math, there's a thing called a rental calculator. You can find one on Bigger Pockets. You can find one on Google. You just Google. This thing will break down everything you need to know. With this here, you will put your asking price, down payment, 20%. We will put the interest rate in. Once you put all these formulas in, and let me give you guys some more, I want you to always Google what the interest, rate in at the interest rate is at the time of your purchase because that makes a difference on your bottom line, all right? So do that. Loan term is always 30 years, even though we're not going to keep it for 30 years. If you can get a 40-year, you should take it because you want your payments as low as possible because you're going to be selling that property, all right? So now, once we put that in, we add closing costs. Closing costs for a bank is traditionally 0.25%. For hard money, it's 2%. That's what it is, right? Now, this is all going to sound like a whole lot, but guys, trust me. This here is, is a cakewalk. You are real estate investors. You are geniuses. This is nothing. Trust me, you're going to get this. Property taxes, how do you find that? You go to Realtor, Zillow, Trulia, or you Google, find out what the property taxes are. Same thing you do in insurance. Maintenance fees. Maintenance fees simply mean if you have to pay for lawn, if you have to pay to get other things done, 
then yes, that's a maintenance fee. But I'm going to tell you, I do not recommend buying properties where you have to pay the light or the gas because you can't control that. I don't recommend buying properties over four units. Why? Because that's mandatory lights and gas. We only want to pay mortgage, taxes, and insurance, things that we can control. I had a property, in, I still have properties there, but in Milwaukee, I had two, of, it was a four unit, two of the units, the toilet flap was broken. Water just kept running through. I get attacked, a uh, water bill for almost $4,000. I'm calling, I'm like, hey, what's going on? Check on it. They go check it and they fix that. But here's the problem. The water company didn't care. I still had to pay that. So don't put yourself in a predicament where you're spending money on things that you could control. So now you would put in a monthly rent, let's say it's the $1,000 vacancy rate. Vacancy rate is when someone moves out, you're saving at least 2% in case that person moves out. But I'm going to tell you a little something here. I'm going to drop it. You pick it up. Insurance companies, when invested in real estate, will have a policy that will pay you the rent until someone moves in, but they won't tell you. So you ask them about this, and they will go, oh, yeah, that's just an additional $17, but we didn't know you knew, all right? So you make sure you ask them that there. So once you get all this into this calculator here, you do your simple math, and guess what? You got your property. You got to figure it out. So I'm going to speed through this right here. I have a little time left. Don't be afraid of numbers. This is a million-dollar house. What does a million-dollar house cost? Real quick, how much a million-dollar house cost? $200,000. You see how, see how I went from this to this? So now with that being the case, how much does a $100,000 house cost? $100,000 house, 20% down is $20,000. You see how I went from here to here? You're only responsible for $20,000. The lenders is responsible for the other 80, and I don't care what the interest rate is and the mortgage payment is if the rent's going to cover it. See, you, you think like an investor, your mindset shifts. And you stop thinking about what do I have to pay and is what is they're going to pay. Not you, because you're an investor. So now, equity, now let's talk about this. Equity in your home could change your life, but I'm going to give you some advice. I would rather you use a HELOC than refinancing. And why is that? A HELOC, now you pull this money out, you put it in a bank account, and when you do use the money, that's when you're charged. You're not charged for that money. But if you refinance your home, now your mortgage payment goes up, and that money's sitting there until you can find out what to do with it. $50,000 can change your life. If I just told you a $100,000 house is $20,000, and now I gave you $50,000, how many houses could you buy with $50,000 and it costs $100,000? dollars. That's right, two houses. Talk back to me. You got two houses. But now, what if you were to partner with someone? Oh, damn, he getting ready to get saucy, y'all. What if you partnered? That means if you have $20,000, you get two houses, you get you a partner, he have $20,000, that's four houses. Group economics is the way to go. You have four houses, and why is that so important? Because now you have equity growth and more properties, and now you have more tax write-off. When you hear about someone has 100 doors, 200 doors, 300 doors of property, you think they own it by themselves? No, that's a syndicate deal. They have partners. Why shouldn't you have some? Have your money grow. My mentor told me I would learn the most valuable lesson once I start partnering. And once I partnered, I went from 10 properties to 20 properties in no time. Let, and here's another key thing I want to tell you guys. Landlord-friendly states is where you need to be in. Landlord-friendly states and other things, buy rental properties in hot markets, colleges, hospitals, transportation hubs, walking distance, downtown. But I'm going to give you a rental play where you don't have to worry about ever finding a tenant. Ever have to worry about finding a tenant. And what is that called? Tenant occupied properties. That's all I buy. I buy things that are cash flowing and making money and I don't have to try to figure it out. And why is this so important? Because what you're going to be doing is thinking like a CEO. If I told you I have this shiny object here, it's brand new, freshly renovated, you can get $1,000 rent for it or I have this other one here, which is great shape. Somebody's been living there for 10 years and they never missed a rent payment in 10 years, but the rent's only $900. Which one, did you, which one would you take? 
I want the guaranteed rent because I don't know the rent history of that other person coming in. That's thinking like a CEO. How? How do you get these properties? Government funded, which is some of the government funded programs. I like Section 8 properties. I like veteran housing. I like programs. Why? Because the government's never late on rent. What's the other thing? Oh, yeah. The government's never late with rent. That's crucial. That's so crucial. What is the criteria for a long-term tenant? They must be living in a property over 12 months. You will request a rent roll that will show their rental status. It will let you know if they've ever been late on the rent. And if they have, you don't want to purchase the property. But if it was one late rent seven years ago and you're buying that property now, I think that's okay. That's a good business deal. You buy that property. And by doing that, you're thinking like a CEO. Now let's talk about the money team. Because you're not doing anything. You need someone to run your team, your money team. Number one on your money team, I'm going to save that. Number two is your lenders. Get to know your lenders. Call them. Know their names. Send them Starbucks cards. Ask about the kids. Ask about the wife. Number three, property management. Property management if you're, is your lifeline. They will be collecting rent, evicting tenants, bringing new tenants in if someone moves. Know your property management company. Next is an out-of-state real estate agent who knows the 1% rule, guys. That's important. A property inspector. Property inspector is also a crucial person to have, and the reason why. Property inspector could tell you, hey, a lot of investors are moving into this area. You need to get over here. Now you didn't even go there, and you found out how great it is. Property inspector could tell you, uh, yeah, I, I've been inspecting some properties, and everybody's been moving. Now you know you don't need to buy there. This is the power of relationships. So now with that being said, you have a contractor just to do some handyman work. Who's the most important person on that money team? Your job. The job makes it all possible. It makes it possible for you to put it on an application to get a loan. It makes it possible for you to pay your bills so you can have a good credit score. The job makes it possible for you to have flexible time to do these things. It all starts with the job. Now you're on the road to become a successful out-of-state real estate investor. That was part one. I want to thank you guys for that part one. But now, here's another crucial thing. I need you to set up your business like a business. We always say, I'm going to start running my business and doing this and that, once this and that. No. If you start now running your business the right way, it will grow for you. You will be prepared when your business grows from 1,000 to 1 million. Notice I didn't say 10,000, 100,000, 300, or half a million. I went straight to where I know you can be and where you need to be. Never sell yourself short in your business. I have a thing called the three must-have LLCs. That there is something that I developed. If you ever hear somebody tell you, I got this thing called, you tell them no, Storm Levery talked about that first. All right? Number one is the acquisition LLC. Acquisition LLC, sole purpose is to buy properties and the LLC over and over and over again. You're going to treat it like personal credit so you can acquire more properties and get those high value loans. I learned the hard way. It, they, you can buy properties in different LLCs, but here's the problem. If you need a $2 million loan, they're going to want to see the history of that LLC. You don't have it. You have 10 different LLCs. They're going to want to need to see everything about those 10. But if you have one LLC, and I have one LLC to have over $2 million in loans, I have no problem with getting more money for those loans. But now you're saying, yeah, but isn't you, uh, 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 you supposed to not have all your properties in one LLC? Well, there's another thing I'm going to show you guys. It's called the holding LLC. After you purchase that property, you're going to take it out of the acquisition LLC, place it in a holding LLC, because the holding LLC is to do certain things. It's anonymity. You're going to have an LLC in states like Wyoming, Delaware, Nevada, because you're going to hide your identity from anyone who tries to attack your LLC and your property. We have about holding LLCs in movies all the time. You know why? Because it's a tool the wealthy use to protect their assets. You telling me you're not wealthy enough? You are wealthy. Start doing this now so when you get that $100 million, you will be able to do these tools, protect your assets. Holding LLC. The third one is a property management company. And why is this one so important? Because now you have a rental property. You bought it in acquisitions. You place it in your holding, but to collecting rent. Where does the rent go? It's property management LLC. 
You don't want to collect rent in the same LLC as the property. The reason being is because if someone slip and falls and they sue because you can't sue an LLC regardless, now your rent is going in the same bank account that's attached to the same LLC that the house is in and they freeze your assets. But if you get a property management LLC specifically opened up in the states you live in because you will be filing taxes on that LLC and... If someone slips and falls, your, your money is protected, your asset is protected, and your acquisition to buy more properties is protected. The acquisition property, the acquisition LLC is solely to buy properties. Holding is to place that in for protection. Property management is to collect the rent. But here's one of the great things. When you have a property management LLC, what you can do now is you have a home office. This is how the wealthy think. Once you have a home office, you can write off 30% of your light, your gas, your mortgage, your rent, your car usage, depreciation, trips. Oh, did I mention what you're paying for here? Yeah, you can write 30% off of that here, depending on that. Guys, why are you not doing this? Who has an LLC? All you have to do is make one phone call and set up a RIA meeting here in Florida. If you know you're going to be here from Thursday to, to Saturday, make a call on Wednesday, set up a meeting, sign a registration, get a card, set up another meeting on Sunday. You're here. What are you doing in between this conference? Now, nah, that's a tax write-off, guys. How many of you have been on my calls and I told you this without telling you this? I need you guys to understand this is what the wealthy do, but we get upset because we don't have the knowledge when in actuality, it's not you actually being upset, it's you being confused. You're asking how, how you can do the same thing. And I need you guys to understand the power of this property management LLC. There's an app called Everlance to track your mouth. Let me slow down. There's an app called Everlance that will track your mileage. Your accountant will ask you, how many miles did you put on your car if you want to write it off? You just give them the mileage due to that app. Your cell phone you can write off. There's so many things you can write off. I easily do ten to $17,000 consistently on write-offs. I can't remember the, let me see, 19, I have not paid taxes in easily over 20 years because of real estate. Real estate, that's what it's about. You can do the same thing. I want you guys to understand the power of this. So now, you guys have now mastered how to run your business. And now let's talk about this one thing, wealth. There's a will and there's a trust. A will is something that leaves people things when you die, the end. What happens with a will? It can be contested by almost anyone. James Brown will was contested by one of his ex-wives, and it was held up in probate court for 14 years until they squared that away. 14 years. And when they finally squared that away, they sold his estate. They had bills. They had things that needed to be paid, and they sold his estate. Living trust. What are the benefits of a living trust? I love this topic. I wish I could stay here for an hour. Tax benefits. You can write things off. Why should you take your house out your name? Put your home in a living trust, you leave it for your kids. If you know your home, you want it to stay in your family for the next 20 years, you will place that home in the name of the trust. In certain states, you can only exceed its trust as far as your last living heir. But in other states, you can have an eternal living, living trust that lasts forever. If you want that property in your family, put it in a living trust. You can also use that living trust to break down the variables of how you, want your, how you want your business to go. Another key thing is minor children. You have a trust. You put your children in that trust. You will now dictate when they get that money who's responsible for that money. Another thing that you can, that you can also do with this living trust here, marriage. If you have a child and they get married and they get divorced, that living trust could strictly say, the spouse gets nothing. Why would you want to build wealth to let somebody else come take it away from your family? Only a trust could do that. Only a trust. Transfer of ownership. How does this work? You need to put your life insurance policies, bank accounts, those things inside a trust. Now I want to break down something to you guys. Who would like to leave $13 million to their great, 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 great grandchildren? Come on. This is a real life example right here. What you would do, 
you would take $500,000, you invest that into a brokerage account, brokerage account for 21 years to your grandchildren, not your children because you have a life insurance and you're leaving them their home. You would now take $500,000, 6% compound interest into that brokerage account for the next 21 years. That would turn into $1.6 million for your grandchildren, but you don't give them $1.6 million. What you do is you give your grandchildren $800,000. You leave the other $800,000 in that brokerage account, and that's going to be for who? Your great-great-grandchildren. Here's a chart that I'm going to break it down for you guys. So now, $800,000 stays invested 21 years, 6% interest. That turns into $2.7 million for your great-grandchildren. And now your great-grandchildren, you only give them half. They get $1.3 million. $1.3 million stays invested for 21 years at a 6% interest, bringing in $4.5 million to your great-great-grandchildren. You don't give them that. You give them half. $2.5 million to your second great-grandchildren. You leave that other $2.5 in there for how many years? That turns with a 6% interest to $7.6 million for your great-great-great-grandchildren. You only give them half. So now that's $3.8 million for your great-great-great-grandchildren. 3.8 stays in for 21 years. 6% interest. That turns into $12.9 million for your great-great-great-grandchildren. Come on. From $500,000? How could this be done? How could this be done if you don't have $500,000? $500,000? Life insurance policy. I just showed you how to give your fourth generation $13 million. Just that easy. Rockefeller used this the same method, and now I'm going to give you one of my guys, Marvin, who's going to tell you exactly how this will be done with that life insurance policy. But there is a way to, to leverage yourself to wealth instead of saving yourself to wealth. There is a way where you can actually put your money into a place that's going to continue to grow uninterrupted as if you never touched it, tax-free, without needing your credit score to be right, even if you lose your job, without restricting what you can borrow, um, without ever telling you when you can borrow. You can borrow any time that you want to, and you can use that money to put it somewhere else and grow an asset where now you're making money two to three times off the same dollar. How many of y'all want to know more? Yeah. All right. So this is called the Wealth Creation Fund. It's going to continue to grow. And you got to understand how leverage works. I can't go any further if you don't understand how leverage works. This is how leverage works. I have $100,000. Well, you all understand real estate. Most of you understand real estate. If I own a home and that home is worth $100,000, and I don't have to do anything, just because it's in that market, it's going to grow by 5%, no matter what. That means I have a $100,000 home, it's going to grow by 5% because of the equity value in the, in the neighborhood has grown. One year later, that $100,000 has grown to what? 105000 right? You got it. All right, now let's go back. Now, I want to do a home equity line of credit. So I have $100,000, and then it's that, that home value, the one year later, it's worth 105000 But this time, I decided to take a home equity line of credit and I borrowed $30,000 against that home. One year later, that $100,000 home is now worth how much? This is what you got to get, and I, and I set you up. I didn't expect everybody to get that right. You got a $100,000 home. It's growing at 5%. If I, if I don't touch it, it's $105,000. If it's worth $100,000, then it's growing by 5%. And if I borrow against it, it's still worth $105,000. The loan that I take has nothing to do with the value of that property and how that property grew. Is that making sense to you all? Because I used the home. I didn't sell the home. You can't sell a portion of the home. I didn't do that. What I did was I borrowed against a portion of the home. I used the home as collateral, but the home continued to grow as if I never touched it. Make sense? Y'all yeah, got that. Now, this Wealth Creation Fund works the exact same way. I'm dumping money into the Wealth Creation Fund first. It's growing as if I never touched it. And when I want to spend something or buy an asset, I'm borrowing against my value, and I'm buying an asset, and that policy is still continuing to grow as if I never touched it. Is that making sense to you all? 
So let me test you one more time. I got $100,000 in my life insurance policy. I don't touch it. It's growing at 5% one year later. How much is that, how much is that cash value worth? 105,000. Now this time it's worth 100, I got $100,000, it's growing by 5%, but this time I borrow $20,000 from that policy. One year later, how much is that policy worth? 105,000. So if it grows the same way, whether I borrow against it, or if I don't borrow against it, doesn't it make sense that I should be borrowing against it? Is that making sense? Now, when you learn that, y'all learn something new? When you learn that, it changes everything because every wealthy person understands the power of leverage, the power of using other people's money, other people's time, other people's systems, other people's teams. So when you use to use the, learn to use the insurance company's money instead of your own money, it's going to change your life because now we can learn how to make money two to three times off the same dollar. So how many of y'all want to know how to make money five times off the same dollar? You got to do what my, what my mentor said in Trash Man to Cash Man, Myron Golden. He said, you got to learn to have pregnant money, which means that you want the parent to grow up long enough to be able to reproduce a child, which is the money, and then you want that money to grow up long enough to reproduce more money, babies, and you can have your pregnant money continuing to reproduce after its own kind over and over and over. How many of y'all want pregnant money? Say pregnant money. Let me show you how to make money five times off the same dollar. The first way that you make money five times off the same dollar is you got to funnel your money, your cash, through this wealth creation fund. That's the insurance policy. Now, it's a special way to structure the insurance policy, which I'm going to talk to you. 90% of insurance agents get this wrong. 90% of insurance agents don't do it the right way because the institution doesn't teach them the right way. Because why would the institution teach them a way that's going to reduce the commissions by 70%? And even if the, the agent knows about it, it's hard to get a man to understand something that their pocketbook depends on them not understanding. When I'm cutting my commissions by 70%, that's tough. But I had to make that decision because I wanted to do the right thing for my clients and the right things for my people. So the first way, you funnel it through the Wealth Creation Fund. The second way, you can actually borrow from the Wealth Creation Fund like Storm was talking about. Now we can put it into a property, whether it be multifamily, whether it be out of state, whether it be a single home, whatever it is. Now you've got your money growing uninterrupted, tax-free, as if you never touched it in the Wealth Creation Fund, and you got the money growing and your cash flow is, is, is increasing in the real estate. That's two times off the same dollar. That was easy, right? Can I go a little deeper? Can I go a little deeper? The, the third way, now this is going to be powerful. Once you learn how to turn your credit into cash, you can learn ways to actually get cash from your credit, and then you buy the asset from the cash that you created from your credit. Now you got the real estate property, for example, earning money. You paid off the credit card with your life insurance policy. You got all the points from the credit card, and you're making money from the cash value life insurance, uninterrupted tax-free. So you're making money on the life insurance, you got the points from the credit card, and you're making money from the real estate property. Can I go a little deeper? Yeah. So if you really learn the secrets and you really want to get spicy, you got all those things already, but you build equity, and then you learn how to double leverage. You got some equity built up in your real estate property. Now you can borrow from that real estate property to get a down payment to get you another real estate property. Now you're making money off of two properties. You're making money off the points from the credit card, and you're making money from the life insurance policy. Can I go a little deeper? Yeah. All right, when you learn the power of LLCs and structures and trusts, and you realize there are certain ways to structure yourself where you can actually depreciate and write off most of your taxes and get LLCs where you can write things off in your business name. Now, you can even minimize the taxes that you're paying on the cash that you're putting into the life insurance policy to begin with. So you can minimize the money on the front end and you can create a structure where if something were to happen to you, then you can actually have that money pass on to your children or whoever it might be and you can actually structure that trust from the grave. So if you, have a spin, if you have a child that you're afraid they're going to be a spendthrift, you can actually set it up where they don't get this until they turn this age. They don't get this until they get a job. They don't get this until they... You can actually control what they do from the grave if you learn how to do it right and minimize your taxes at the same time. Does that sound good? Yeah. All right. I got to teach you a little bit more. That's how you make money five times off the same dollar. Going back to the wealth creation fund, when you know that, you can learn to spend money 
This is basically what we're doing, just like the debtor. We're spending money, but then we're paying ourselves back. Now, here's the power about this leverage. With life insurance, if you don't want to, you can actually borrow from your policy, and believe it or not, you don't even have to pay it back. What do you mean you don't have to pay it back? I just took a loan. If I did that at the bank, they'll be coming after me, reporting me to the credit bureau. Remember, it's collateral. So when you're borrowing against your policy, your cash value is always much lower than your death benefit. What that means is that if my cash value is $100,000 and my death benefit is $500,000, if I borrow $80,000 from my policy and never pay it back, it's simply going to be subtracted from my death benefit when I die, which is $500,000 minus the $80,000 plus interest, and the rest of it goes for my beneficiaries. So I essentially just took a loan that I never had to pay back. Now, just because of that, just because I know that I can do that, should I not pay it back? You absolutely should pay it back because when you do pay it back, you increase your borrowing capacity to continue to do this and keep living this lifestyle over and over and over. So what I tell people to do is I want you to be an honest banker, which means the same way that you would borrow from an institution and pay them back, borrow from your policy and pay yourself back. Because when you learn to do that, you're going to continue to see that compound interest maximize and grow uninterrupted for the rest of your life. So which type of insurance do I use, right? Because there's whole life, there's index universal life, there's term life. And I'm not against any of them. In fact, I believe there doesn't have to be an either or. It can be a both and. And in this case, I have term insurance, I have whole life insurance, and I have index universal life insurance. So if anybody ever tells you there's only one right, one right way and you need to run from everything else, you need to see if they even have the ability to offer the things that they're telling you not to do. Because there's a lot of people out here who are teaching you something based on what their company is telling them that they can do, not based on what's actually possible for you. So term life is good if you have a house and you want to make sure it's paid off in 10 years. I mean. I mean, you want to make sure that you got a lot of debt, and if you pass away in those 10 years, your kids and your family is taken care of. I prefer whole life or index universal life. Whole life, if it's structured the right way, you can have the, you structure it for the lowest amount of death benefit for the highest amount of cash value. The lowest amount of death benefit for the highest amount of cash value. When you structure it that way, all of a sudden it's not death insurance anymore. You've actually turned it into life insurance, which is the actual name of it, which means it should benefit you for your life, not just for your death. Somebody say, for my life. For my, y'all learning something right now. For my life, you all, for my life. So whole life, I would choose whole life if I wanted to borrow from it quicker. Because I can structure it in a way that I can actually borrow from it after only about 30 days. It's going to give me a fixed rate of return. That fixed rate of return is going to be maybe somewhere between 4 to 5 percent. The dividends are not guaranteed, but they have paid it for 126 consecutive years. So it's pretty close to being that word that I can't say. However, it's fixed. You know what you're getting every single year. You can borrow against it. There's no surprises. For some people, that's a good thing. Index universal life, you have the ability to earn more. What that means is if I know that I can earn up to 12 percent, if the market did okay, if, if the market did 5, I can make up the 5. If it did 10, I can make up the 10. If it did 12, I can make up the 12. If it did 15, the most I can make is 12. But if it goes down, I know that I'm guaranteed not to lose based on the market. So I know that I can make up to a certain amount, but I also know that I can't lose more than any fees that are in a policy. That's important because I might average a lot more long term by having an index universal life, but I'm limited to I can't borrow as much from it in the earlier years. So if your goal is to borrow more early, it might not be a whole um, uh, index universal life. But if your goal is to let this sit for a minute and then borrow from it later and then use it maybe for retirement tax-free, you might consider an index universal life. But again, remember, I have both. I have all three. So it doesn't have to be a both uh, either or. It can be a both and, both and right? So with that being said, I want to tell y'all really quickly how I've used my wealth creation fund. I want to give y'all some real examples that I've actually done in my real life. This is all real factual stuff, not stuff hypothetical that I'm telling you. One way is um, you met Rasul. I got Rasul into the, uh, the multifamily game. Now Rasul is getting me into the multifamily game because he, he just blew up. I got like 422 units. I think he got like 3,000 units of real estate. 
So we do deals together all the time. So sometimes I will borrow from my policy to get my down payment, get, get a partnership and a collaboration with some people so I'm not fronting all the money. I'll pay my down payment with my wealth creation fund and I'll start getting residual income passively every quarter, every three months I'm getting a check. And sometimes something happens that's really amazing. I had this one multifamily property with Rasul. We had it for um, about, what, 14 months? 13, I'm sorry, 13 months. We had it for 13 months. We bought it for about 1.8 million, and the goal was to sell it for 3.2 million or something in, um, in five years. That was the plan. But in 13 months, somebody offered to buy it for like 3.8 million. So of course we decided to sell it, and then we got all of the equity from it. We got all of the cash flow. I just paid my life insurance policy back. My money was still growing as if I never touched it from the life insurance policy. And it grew in equity and in income from the multifamily property. Now I just, now I just leveraged and increased the returns. I would have made a lot of returns if I would have used my cash to do the multifamily. But it feels so much better with that money. I never had to see that money decrease. It only increased and I made money on this side. That sound good? Y'all want one more example? Here's another example. This is my home. This is my actual, a picture of my actual house from Atlanta, right? Here's the deal. I don't even live in Atlanta. I'm still trying to figure out how to get to Atlanta full time. I still got a place in St. Louis. So why would I buy a $2 million house when I don't even live in that city? Because I learned something that it's called luxury arbitrage. If you learn how to do this right, you can actually turn luxury to an asset instead of a liability. So if I rent this thing out, which I have for 10 days out of the month, it will make me $20,000. I'm making $20,000 from that. I still can stay in there 15, 20, um, 20 years out, I mean 15 to 20 days out of the month. In my life insurance policy, I got what's called a no-doc loan, so I only had to borrow $100,000, 5%, to get a $2 million property, and that gave me the instant leverage that I need. It didn't matter what the interest rate was because I knew that no matter what the interest rate was, my note was going to be in electricity and everything was going to be 10000 So if I'm making twenty dollars to $30,000, who cares what my interest rate was? I got ten dollars to $20,000 more every month that I didn't have before. And my life insurance policy is still growing tax-free as if I never touched it. So I want y'all to understand something. When I talk about become your own bank, I'm not talking about the life insurance. The life insurance is just a tool. Life insurance is not an investment. Life insurance is a tool that you funnel it through if you know how to do it right, but you gotta have the mindset of an investor so that now that you can borrow against it and invest, because the last thing that you wanna do is borrow against it to go by depreciating assets. You're, defe you're defeating the purpose. So mindset over everything, and once you get the mindset, the infinite banking is going to work in your favor. Can I give you another way I use this to make money? Yeah. Options trading. Now, I want you all to be careful with this because you got to understand it, but at the same time, I sat and I watched Myron. I'm sitting on a plane with Myron. I paid $200,000 to spend a day because you know what? You might say, but, but isn't Myron your friend? That's why I paid him. See, you got to understand, too many people, y'all see what I'm saying? There's too many cheapo people that's in a room who want to go to their friends and attempt to get a discount. If you're a premium person, not only do you not negotiate a discount, you say, how can I pay you full price and what else? And in fact, what else can I buy from you to add value to you? You know why? Because people respond to you in the way that you respond to them. People don't buy who you are. People don't even buy what you do. People buy the consistent actions that you take every single day. So if I'm somebody who I believe in paying other people for their service, if I'm somebody who believes in taking action fast, if I'm somebody who believes in committing first and figuring out the rest later, I'm going to attract people who don't want a discount, only want premium, take action fast with you, and they're willing to commit to you without knowing all of the details. Does that make sense? The reason why some of you are held back because everybody has to think about it because every time you met with an opportunity, you got to think about it. So if you want, want people to stop thinking about things for you, you got to start taking actions. Anyway, I digress. But I had to explain that to you. With the options trading, which I learned, 
What I did was I did a play with GameStop. When GameStop was actually um, crashing, I mean, going way, way up, I said there's no way that the big institutions are going to allow these little guys to keep winning. It had went up by like some crazy amount, like 200 points in one day. Because I had money, not in the bank, but I had it in my brokerage account, I had the ability to make a fast, quick decision, and I decided that I would actually buy puts, which means that I would bet on the opposite side that instead of the market going up, I would actually bet that it was going to go down. When it went down, I put $100,000 that I had for my life insurance, put it into my brokerage account just to have myself prepared for the opportunity. The $100,000 made me $300,000 in one day because it went down by that much in one day. Now, I want you all to understand, you say, well, that's risky because you could have lost that $100,000, boom, easy, just, just like that. That's gambling. But when you understand the power of leverage, it changes everything. Remember what I just told you. The money that's in your life insurance policy, when you borrow against it, you don't have to pay it back. It's simply subtracted from your death benefit when you die. So I knew that I was taking a risk, but I also knew that I didn't have to rush to pay it back because worst case scenario, I had to leave that loan on my life insurance policy and it was going to be subtracted from my death benefit when I die. So I made an educated, calculated risk that it's not the end of the world if I lose, but if I win, I win big. How many of y'all know with $300,000 that I could have bought this next opportunity, which is this Lamborghini in cash if I wanted to?